I'm going to talk about some of the, the studies I've been doing on, on uh, life history strategies in amphibians and, and especially uh, on how life histories are affected by environmental stress because I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in the process and mechanism that allow, larvae, uh, allow organisms to, to cope with, with environmental stress. Because we, I mean, we all know that animals and not any organisms are exposed to many different and, uh, environmental stresses and the variation of these environmental stresses from variation in predators or competitors or the, the diversity and the intensity of, of diseases. But more and more we are also seeing how uh, anthropogenic stress is affecting uh, natural systems. So, from over-exploitation to habitat destruction to the interaction of, of parasites and, uh, and uh, predators, exotic parasites and predators. Many uh, natural environments have been modified by, by human activities. And when we talk about uh, anthropogenic stress in natural systems, we need to talk about climate change, of course. And climate change is mainly uh, always represented by this increase in, in the average temperature that we have been uh, seeing over the last decades. Uh, this is kind of the long-term effect of environmental change, a more clear uh, effect of, of climate change on environments. But something that is uh, a bit less well studied and less well uh, considered is that also climate change is frequently linked to uh, the more extreme, more frequent extreme uh, climatic events, so more frequent heat waves, droughts, uh, sea storms, or, or rain, precipitation events. And uh, this pose uh, uh, organisms to two different uh, scenarios. They need to adapt to a long-term trend in environmental change, but they also need to adapt to this more abrupt and, and extreme environmental change. And uh, how could they, they face this sort of environmental stress, these changes in environmental stress? Well, one of the things is just by modifying life histories. Uh, this is kind of representation of what life history means. That is a bit of the life of an organism. Uh, and when we talk about life histories, we talk about life history strategies, which is a bit the combination of how they balance all the activities that organisms need to, need to do in their lives. So how they balance development and growth and uh, reproduction, lifespan activity, and how all these uh, different traits uh, affect each other and the trade-offs are uh, between all these traits. So we know from, from humans that there are life history strategies like this, life fast, die young. Uh, we know from humans that it's a uh, quite common life history strategy, even, if, even among humans there is variation. So it's, there is people that live fast but still don't die anymore. So, uh, even in humans, we have variation in life history strategies, and it's the same in, in natural environments. That's the interest of studying life history strategies. There's an uh, enormous amount of variation that could be, could be used for facing environmental change. And as I said, I mean, organisms are facing two different trends. A long-term trend in, in environmental change caused by climate change that could lead to this kind of classic example of uh, adaptation by natural selection in which generation after generation organisms could move from a sort of phenotypic optimum to a different phenotypic optimum. But this is the kind of long-term trend. So uh, something that happens with many generations with, with uh, a lot of time. But when organisms are exposed to more extreme and abrupt uh, environmental change, they need to develop responses within a single generation. And that's why it's important to study not just the evolution of life history, but also the plasticity of these life histories. And by plasticity, uh, well, we all know that plasticity is how organisms can develop different phenotypes to respond to different environmental conditions. Uh, a single organism without any uh, genetic modification can develop and can show different uh, phenotypes uh, in response to different environmental conditions they, they are facing. So that's... Uh, so that's why studying the plasticity of life history strategies could help us to understand how organisms can face these extreme and abrupt uh, changes in the environment. So, as, as I said, I'm going to talk mainly about how uh, amphibians in particular face phenological changes. 
and the phenology is a kind of the seasonal timing of uh, biological events. So when things happen, it's all about when, it's not about timing, when organisms uh, reproduce, when organisms uh, migrate, or when the flowers flower, or when they start the hibernation. It's all about when things happen. And this is relevant because when things happen, uh, it's being affected by climate change. It's one of the things that is more clearly affected by current climate change. So many species are breeding earlier than ever, uh, going to hibernation later than ever, and all the, the patterns of or flowering or, or migration has been uh, altered on the last decades. So it's one of the things that we have clear information because we have long phenological data sets. We have clear evidence that this kind of life history strategies, all like these life history traits, have been uh, sifted into a different uh, optimum over the last decades. So one of the relevant things about studying phenology is that phenology mainly affects the length of the growth system for many organisms. So when we are studying temperate uh, environments with clear seasons, a change in phenology will lead to a change in the growth season length and this to different kind of time constraints experienced by the organisms and that leads to difference in, in the stress. So a longer growth season is, is going to relax time constraints and lower stress levels and the opposite with a shorter uh, growth season length. So I'm going to talk about the, how, how the life history strategies could be affected by changes in phenology. So how organisms can modify life history strategies in response to a variation in, in phenology, mainly in, in red in phenology. And uh, as I said, work with amphibians and amphibians in temperate environments. Amphibians are, are exposed to clear seasons, so it's a fixed amount of time they have to grow, to reproduce. Um, so that there are, in general, pretty time constrained organisms. As well, we all know that the classical amphibian life cycle is uh, an aquatic stage with uh, start with reproduction and uh, with larval stage that ended with metamorphosis and then back to the terrestrial environment. So it's this kind of biphasic life history, uh, complex life, life cycle, which uh, can be exposed to environmental pressure both, both in land and, and in the aquatic environment. So those complex life cycles is pretty crucial to have a correct timing of, of the uh, of breathing and metamorphosis and, and so on. So when organisms reproduce, it's going to condition when they metamorphose, and uh, all this is going to affect uh, fitness. So when, when breathing is, is modified either towards earlier breathing or late breathing, it's going to have quite, quite probably an, an effect on metamorphosis. Either the time of metamorphosis, the, time, the size of metamorphosis individuals, and so on. So e even more because most, uh, many species uh, are explosive breeders. And by explosive breeder, I mean they breed uh, all the population in a really short time period. So any change on the, on the population breeding time is going to affect uh, quite clearly the population dynamics and demographies and so on. So we have these three different scenarios. The population that's breeding is sort of the average uh, timing, the timing that is kind of the common one over the last decades. But due to this kind of fluctuation on environmental condition, this kind of more extreme events, kind of longer than ever winters or shorter than ever winters, uh, we also have quite, quite common now that they could breed earlier than average or later than average. This is kind of the system I'm going to use in the, in the talk. So I'm going to try to explain how differences in the breeding phenology can change the, the life history of strategies, can change the trajectories of growth and development in, in larvae. Um, yeah. uh, I'm going to show studies on two different species I work with, the common frog and the moor frog. Both are pretty common in, in uh, all across Europe, more or less. Com the moor frog is not present in the Iberian Peninsula, but they are pretty common and abundant species. Both are explosive breeders, uh, and both live in, in a wide variation of, of environmental uh, conditions. So, and I, I work mainly in, in Scandinavia, in Sweden. Uh, and if, if we know something about Sweden, is that up there is 
it's cold and dark for a big part of the year. And uh, cold and dark mean that the growth season is pretty short. So organisms are normally exposed to a really short uh, growing period, really short growth length. Actually, growth length in some of our population in the northern part of Scandinavia are the shortest in, in Europe. That is mainly two, two months of good weather for organisms to breed and to reproduce. So you could imagine that any change on this, on this uh, growth season lens could have a really severe effect on, on the life history of the organisms. So as I said, a shorter growth season that is kind of normal in Scandinavia uh, leads to higher time constraints and higher level of stress. And that's, that's already the normal situation. So organisms, they have a really narrow window of, of good weather to, to breathe and reproduce up there. That means that they should breathe as early as possible, even when still big areas of the ponds are still uh, with ice. Uh, and that could lead to, to also to pretty severe effects. So if you breathe too early, it's uh, quite common that uh, breathing will fail. So most of the, of the eggs could just be frozen again and, and reproduction is over for the year. So the correct timing of, of breathing is really crucial for, for those organisms in that kind of time constrained environments. So yeah. What we do, how we study life history strategies in amphibians. So we normally go during the start of the breeding season and collect breeding adults, or in other circumstances, collect uh, already laid eggs as fresh as possible and bring it back to the, to the lab. So we do sort of uh, experimental approach, reading larvae in different conditions of uh, uh, predator stress or phenology stress or whatever temperature. Uh, with larva going from hatchling to, to metamorphosis. So we could analyze kind of key traits in the life history of, of uh, amphibians or life history of the larval amphibians, which is how, how long is the larval period? What is the mass of metamorphosis of, of the juveniles? Are the two main uh, traits that is gonna affect uh, fitness in, in amphibians. But also, well, we combine those on, on growth rates and we look at activity rates and larval morphology, especially when we expose larvae to, to predators. So the main things I'm going to talk here is how early breeding phenology affects uh, amphibian life histories, or how, just the other side of the spectrum, how delayed breeding phenology affects the life history of organisms, and how breeding phenology combines with stress caused by the presence of predators. And then uh, a bit kind of sort things about what are the cost of life history strategies because we know that it's always a trade-off between developing one response to, it's gonna trade off against the other responses. And also a bit of like a pretty preliminary ideas and activation mechanisms of those responses. So first, how early breeding affects life history in, in frogs? Well, that's, as I put it before, early breeding normally leads to a longer uh, growth system, so a more relaxed situation, more relaxed time constraints, and a lower stress in, in larvae. So they have an extra time to grow and develop, so everything could be easy and, and, and more relaxed. So this is experiment we conducted in 2008 and 9, collecting uh, eggs in, in population really in high latitudes in, uh, above the Arctic Circle. Uh, with uh, Rana Temporaria. So this, these two years in which we collected uh, eggs were pretty different in the, in the breeding uh, season. It was just a lucky coincidence. But 2008 was, was a much earlier year. It was 20 days, 20 days earlier. Uh, breeding happens than, than in, in 2008. It was a kind of average year. So you could imagine what 20 days extra could have in population that are normally exposed to a growth season length of just a couple of months. So it's a huge difference. So it was a bit lucky, but we look at what happens in, in this year, how life history changes with an extra time for growth and develop. So we collected uh, yeah, eggs in 2008 and 2009. We ran a group of tadpoles on, on containers, and we look at all these uh, life history traits that I mentioned before. So the first clear result was that with early breeding, 
larval period was extended. It was extended substantially. It was extended 11 days. So uh, tadpoles take longer, take sort of uh, less stressful uh, growth. So they, they, they extended the larval period 11 days. But if you remember, there was a year with breeding starting 20 days. So even if they managed to extend the larval period, they still metamorphose earlier in the year than uh, in 2008. So it was kind of all a beneficial response. They, they could relax the sort of development, but still uh, have the advantage of metamorphosis still earlier in the year. Not only early, earlier, but also uh, larger, substantially larger, 25% larger. So it's kind of all the benefits that, that should be associated with a more relaxed uh, uh, situation. So extended larval uh, season and uh, much uh, larger size of metamorphosis that both link to a higher growth rate. So in summary, under relaxed time constraints, they are able to extend the larval period to go for a strategy with a kind of more relaxed, more relaxed strat strategy. Now we have the opposite situation. What happens when breeding occurs later than, than average? How they face that? So uh, in this case, a kind of a shorter growth, uh, a later breeding leads to a shorter uh, growth season, which increases time constraints as, and stress in organisms. So they are exposed to a much higher level of environmental stress. So uh, this time this experiment we conducted in 2010 with Ranar Valleys on uh, central Sweden. Uh, when we, we collect adults and we go for two different sort of treatments. We as do artificial crosses of, of those adults and produce eggs as soon as we collect it. So we have larvae that were not exposed to any kind of breeding delay. But with the other half of the adults, we just keep them uh, separated by sexes in, uh, in cold conditions, four degrees, that prevented all kind of breeding. So when, when we finally do the artificial crosses, those eggs were, and those larvae were produced with a delay of six days. They were experiencing almost a week uh, of breeding delay. So we increased artificially the level of, of uh, phenological stress in a way. So with, with those larvae, we did the same approach. We read it in, in containers with larvae exposed with no delay, and larvae exposed with a six-day delay. So what happens when we do that is that the larvae exposed to a late breeding, the larvae we artificially delay, they were able to shorten the larval period by four days. That is almost two thirds of the, of the time that we delay artificially the breeding. So we're able, um, on, on the previous cases with early breeding, they were able to extend the larval period. Here they were able to shorten larval periods. So all these kind of plastic responses to phenological stress. There were no differences in muscle metamorphosis. So although the, the larval period was shorter, they were growing faster, much faster. So this is a kind of positive side. They metamorphose earlier, and they metamorphose uh, with no differences in size. So they can, in a way, face a strong time constraints by uh, speeding up larval, larval development, by speeding up larval period. So this is kind of the basic strategy. So with more time, it's kind of more relaxed strategy. With less time, it's kind of more stress strategy. But I mean, what happens when we have more realistic situation? We put predators also in there. How the presence of predators could affect this kind of life history strategies? Uh, first, because we know that predators are really one of the more uh, stronger selective forces for, for tadpoles in nature. They prey heavily in, in larvae. Even if you have three predators, they could consume 80% of the larvae you have in tanks, or even all the, all the, the ones that you have. So. The classic antiperator responses of, of tadpoles is they, they reduce activity levels. They normally uh, extend the larval period. They could develop morphological uh, uh, defenses. And they normally have uh, higher mass of metamorphosis if, if, if they were exposed to, to kind of non-lethal predators. And the thing is that all these that are now in orange are reduction in activity the development of morphological defenses or extension of the larval period are going to clear to be confronted with uh, any, any chance to develop faster in response to phenological stress or something like that. So it's, it's clear that we have a trade-off between responding to an increased st stress in phenology 
and then uh, increase stress by predators. So that's the interest of looking at how predation on phenology could shape life history strategies. So th this is kind of uh, trying to combine the two experiments that I presented before, but adding predators now on the system. So what we do is, is it's kind of the containers we use normally. So we have a cage with a bottom made of mess. We put a dragonfly larvae inside. We fed the dragonfly inside the cage. So there is all kind of chemical cues produced by, by predators consuming uh, larvae that are on the water. So all these larvae are exposed to a situation of predators in the environment consuming kind of specifics. So the first thing we look at is activity. So we monitor in a 30 second period the activity of all those larvae with the idea of a kind of when you are exposed to predators, you should have a more conservative approach and, the, and reduce your, larva, your, your activity. So now we have the three different treatments so normal breathing, early breathing, and late breathing. Without predators or no predator, they all maintain the same kind of activity levels, kind of pretty high activity levels. So with predators on the environment, as I said, kind of normal larvae reduce substantially the, the activity rates in order to rate in order to not be detected by the predators. Um, when larvae have more time, when, when there are relaxed time constraints and there are early breeders, they are able to reduce even further the, the activity rate. So they, they could go for a more uh, conservative strategy. They have time, so they don't need to, to rust, even if those guys don't rust too much. But with late breathing, uh, there is a bit of mix of results. Uh, the six day delay, they maintain the same level of activity of the, of the normal breeders. But the ones from the really Arctic condition, the ones that were uh, exposed to 20, 20 days uh, shorter larval, larval period, they even increase activity rates. So they, they have to increase activity rates in order to metamorphose, but they quite clearly will pay uh, a price on survival when they are exposed to predators if they are more active. So we also look at morphology. We, we know, I mean, many studies, tadpole develop two different morphologies, uh, or many different, but especially when they are exposed to predators, they have a normal morphology, and they have a kind of defensive morphology that is mainly characterized by the uh, development of uh, deeper tails, tails that act as sort of attraction to predator attacks that could go for this kind of thin, thin areas that are not particularly vulnerable, so they could divert all the attacks from the really important part, is the body part. So it's a, it's a clear, clearly successful uh, strategy to, to reduce uh, capture. So we have this kind of geometric morphometric approach in which we uh, put a set of uh, 19 landmarks and semi-landmarks and try to characterize the shape of, of the tadpoles with and without predators. So we have this kind of shape patterns. So without predators, of course, no one developed anything but the kind of basic morphology. They don't invest in anything. They don't need it. <clears throat> when some normal tadpoles are exposed to, to predators, they are able to develop this kind of standard uh, defensive morphology, which is what we expected. So now there's the interesting thing will happen with changes in inbreeding phenology. So with early breeding, so as I said, kind of more time to invest in everything. They also invest in morphological defenses that are able to develop this uh, defensive morphology. But as you may expect already, with a late breeding and more uh, time constraints uh, a scenario, they don't invest anything in defenses. So it's all put into, into development, into try to develop as fast as possible and shorten larval period as much as possible to escape this whole phenological uh, stress. So they almost don't reduce or even increase activity. They don't develop uh, morphological defenses. So when we look at uh, how larval, larval period is, we know this from before. There is a kind of decline in larval period as, as the stronger the, the phenological stress is. And it's more or less the same what happens with predators. They all extend the larval period, but still there is a clear kind. So there's no additional effect of phenology on on the, on the developmental responses. So just, just to summarize this area, uh, early breathing is all kind of positive 
uh, aspect for, for tadpoles development. They could develop morphological uh, defenses, they could extend larval period, and they could reduce activity so they are not detected as much by, by predators. And late breeding is a mix of, of, of activities. Activity could be even higher, which is clearly negative. They don't develop morphological uh, responses, but they are able to reduce larval periods. It looks like it's all focused on uh, trying to sort the larval period as much as possible, even at the risk of being detected by predators. So they invest all in development. So it's this kind of, we have a slow and safe strategy with early breeding. They have time, they could just develop slowly and, de and uh, develop all kinds of morphological defenses. But with a scenario of, of higher environmental stress, higher phenological stress, they just go for the fast and risky strategy. <laughs> develop as fast as possible, otherwise they will not metamorphose in time. So they will either be, ca be captured in the, in the ponds when they refreeze again in, in the autumn, or they will just metamorphose in really bad conditions. So they go for the fast and risky, and risky strategy. Yeah, of course, I mean, with, when we talk about life history strategies, any kind of investment in one a strategy that they gonna have uh, one effect on other strategies, and there are many costs associated to life history strategies. So when uh, amphibians are developing different uh, life history strategies in response to phenology, they are clearly gonna incur in some costs that those life history strategies. I mean, we have the clear cost. If you breed too early, kind of, uh, Winter kick can came back, and even the adults could be just uh, dying on the ponds because they refreeze again. So all the uh, dead larvae that were caught on the on the mating period. But if you breed too late, it will be too late for for the larvae to escape the ponds before the winter arrives. So you remember, this is Sweden. This is a really short time period. So everything should be balanced because too early is negative, but too late is also negative. So. We have been looking at some of the physiological costs of the, I mean, earlier, earlier breeding there has no, no apparent cost. I mean, they could relax everything, but the late breeding, the more um, environmental stress there are exposed, are leading to faster growth strategies, faster development strategies, and they are gonna incur quite clearly in physiological cost. So yeah, we have organisms normally in nature, they, they grow with a kind of sub-maximal rate. So when they are exposed to, to a stronger, uh, in this case, phenological stress, because they, they, in this case, are born later, they are able to maximize growth. But maximize growth is normally associated with negative effects on, on this kind of things that we have been looking at. So immune response, the level of stress hormones, oxidative stress level in the cells, or telomere uh, dynamics. So we have been looking at a bit of this, many are pretty preliminary things, but uh, especially one that is already finished is what is the effect of the phenological stress on immune responses. So we injected tadpoles with phytoamaglutinin that uh, induce an uh, inflammatory response that is linked to, to uh, immune response. So the higher the, the immune response on the tadpoles, the, the higher the inflammatory response you are gonna observe. So we, took larvae exposed to different envir uh, environmental stress, to different phenological stress, took a photo before and after we injected them with, with uh, phytoimaglutinin on the, on the base of the tail. So as I said, a uh, uh, better immune response, they will lead to a uh, stronger inflammatory response. So and the kind of interesting result we had is that larvae that are exposed to a more stressful environment, the one with delayed breathing, they have three times lower immune response than the ones that are experiencing their kind of normal breeding development. So they really paid a cost, a price on immune response level when they are developing this fast development uh, strategy. It's something that you expect, but I think it's pretty, pretty nice and, and cool result. So we have been, yeah, as I said, phase pace of life in response to breeding delay, they reduce the strength of the immune response in, in tadpoles, which of course could be highly negative in you, if uh, you are exposed to diseases in, in, the, in the ponds. So for the other uh, responses, was part of the uh, work that Pablo was doing with me in, in uh, Uppsala when he was there. So we have been looking at 
the levels of uh, stress hormones, oxidative stress levels are coming from the lab any time, I guess. And they also tell me dynamics that I guess uh, we are going to do a bit later. So all these are clear. I mean, what we expect, what well, I expect, is a higher level of stress hormones and a higher oxidative stress level and uh, okay, telomere say, damage or shorter telomeres as, as higher the environmental stress is. But uh, yeah, we'll see. So uh, something that remains, I don't know, it's probably it's not clear when I explain it, but it's, it's how, how the larvae do this, how the larvae are able to track phenological uh, cues. Because as I said at the beginning, we do all of our experiments on the lab. So all the larvae are exposed to this kind of environment. They are reared on, on big containers and small vials, but always under lab condition. And they came from quite often from uh, adults that we collected during the breeding season. We do artificial crosses on the lab. And then we rear them with the kind of standard conditions, 20 degrees, 18, 16, 8, a light cycle, so they are never exposed to changes in temperature, in, uh, uh, temp in, in, in seasonal advance, in photo period. So they develop all these responses with any kind of external cues, and uh, they, are, they are even born on the, on the lab. So it's quite clear a, a case of transgenerational response, in which wherever the mechanisms, uh, adults or the mother is able to transfer some kind of phenological timing to the, well, not even the embryo, to the pre-zygotic stage, that uh, are, are able to, to just keep this, this kind of clock, this track, and, uh, and response uh, to the condition that the parents are experiencing at breathing. So this is a pretty cool example of yeah, transgenerational uh, maternal effects in a way. So we are trying to look a bit deeper on that, so we did so yeah, trying to understand how tadpoles adjust the pace of growth and development in response to changes in phenology, even if they have never experienced any kind of environmental cue. So this year we have been doing this gene expression analysis using this kind of chips from Xenopus, in which we try to look at differential gene expression uh, between uh, larvae that are experiencing a normal breathing and larvae that are experiencing a delayed breathing. Trying to see if there are some genes that are more or less expressed as, as higher the environmental or the phenological stresses. So we are looking especially at genes like this clock genes or period genes and how higher or lower is this uh, genes expression and how this is linked to differences in life history or strategy. But, uh, well, this uh, the same as, as with the uh, physiological cost of the, of the different life history strategies will be, will be enough. Later, so yeah, this and something else is on the on the way. So yeah, just to summarize everything, the first of all, I mean, there is a huge amount of plasticity in life history strategies in tadpoles, so they are able to modify most of the life history traits in response to phenology. They are able to change activity, uh, morphology, development rates to try to respond to to differences in in environmental stress, even if they pay some cost, of course. Um, and in this particular case, it's quite clear they, they are able to adjust these life history strategies to the strength of time constraints. So the stronger the, the effect, the faster and the riskier the life history strategy is. This kind of big summary. So, well, yes, time to thank many of my collaborators, especially, yes, Ansi Laurila and Alex Richter from the an M model from Uppsala University, Alfredo Nicieza from the University of Oviedo, and many others, and uh, some of the people that have been funding from the Spanish Ministry of Science when it existed at the beginning, and the many other uh, Swedish foundations. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs>